All right, welcome to the Quick Media Come Follow Me series. In this episode, we are covering the books of Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Now, we are way behind in this, so what we're going to do is we'll do this episode. We'll follow up next week with the, or tomorrow, with the next episode in the Come Follow Me series, and then we'll backtrack, and there's two or three that we need to get back to and finish off. So that will be the process that we go to through here to... Uh, to catch up this time around. Okay, so in this episode, um, these are three prophets, Nahum, Habakkuk, and and Zephaniah, that are living during the time of Lehi. And so this is about the second half, more likely the second half of the uh, 7th century BC. We can even get even in close to maybe many, many... Many scholars say that that uh, you know about 615 BC is when you see the the fall of Assyria. 612 BC is the rise of Babylon. So this is right in about that time, right? Nahum is is prophesying about about Assyria, about about Nineveh, which is now falling. Uh, surprisingly, really, it, it it seems to be they're they're historians have different ideas on maybe why this happens, but it, it seems to be decadence, really, is the problem with Assyria. And we, the, the prophet Nahum goes into this a little bit, but he's going to come in and he's going to talk about using, as the Old, prophet, the Old Testament prophets do, using the current events and especially using the adversarial kingdoms as uh, metaphors for the last days. And there's something I want you to see here that, again, is is very important. We've talked about this many times, but we don't realize just how much of the scriptures come from visions. And and I think we overlook that quite a bit. And I think it's important to see this because, number one, with Nahum here, chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of Nineveh, the burden being the uh, the doom that is the evident, the, the imminent doom coming to, to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And then it says, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Okay, so a couple things here. Number one, the, the vision means that this is prophecy. He's getting this beforehand. He's not writing this afterward. Uh, now, we may have a version of this now that comes in and is edited afterward, etc. But this is coming beforehand. This is These are visionary men. Laman and Lemuel talk about their own father, Lehi, being a visionary man. There is a lot of this happening around this time. And and you get, you know, you have Daniel, you have Ezekiel, who are her contemporaries. You have uh, Habakkuk and, and Zephaniah and, uh, and Nahum here, who are seeing visions. And Lehi, seeing visions. And Nephi, seeing visions. They are visionary men. And so there is this rooting, I believe, in both prophecy and, I would suggest, because a lot of these are centered, these visions are centered in the temple and the throne of God. They're, they're, they're centered on the king of kings. They're centered on Jehovah. And so to a certain degree, these are prophecies anchored in Jesus Christ or anchored in Jehovah at this time. And that, that's an important thing to understand because... If you, if you follow the prophecies, if you follow the visions, many of them will lead you back in a hierarchical structure, back to the throne of God, which is part of the Israelite drama, the ancient Israelite drama, about God being enthroned in the Holy of Holies. And then the king represents Jehovah, and he is enthroned in the Holy of Holies. And he represents those in the for example, at the Feast of Tabernacles, in where men and women are in their tents, right, their tabernacles, looking not at the palace but at the temple and watching this temple drama play out. And they participate in this, just like we do in our temple ceremonies today. But visions, right? Notice here, Nahum, it is a vision. So he has this vision about Nineveh and how it's going to fall. A couple of things I think are really interesting here. Uh, when you ver- look at verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger. <laughs> this is kind of like what he talks about when in the Scriptures when they talk about peace. They always talk about peace amongst the storm, which is very interesting to me. It, it's, it's not, peace is not usually 
depicted in the scriptures as everything is wonderful. It, it's usually there is peace among the storm. All of these problems that are happening right now, all this adversity is happening, and yet there is peace, like a still small voice with Elijah, right? Here it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. So the wicked will have their just day. Now, why is that important if you're not wicked? Why is it important to, to point a finger at someone, to say, see, I was right? No, it's not that. It's, it's to understand that the Lord is just. And in our times today, you can see the decadence rising and, and adversity increasing. And um, it's important to understand that the Lord is just, but he is slow to anger. And that goes for yourself, too. That's, that's an important thing. Just above that, in verse 2, it says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. So again, it's the same kind of idea. that These are the attributes of God. But even though he revengeth and, and is furious, he's going to be slow to anger. In other words, it takes a bit for things to play out before justice finally prevails. Okay, so and then, and then skipping back from where we get the Lord is slow to anger, in verse 4, he rebuketh the sea, maketh it dry, drieth up all the rivers, uh, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and then down in 6, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? So he is slow to anger, but that anger is there. And I would say that anger is, is played out and manifested through justice, both spiritually and physically or uh, uh, materially in our actions and ultimately in our spirits and in our bodies, in our resurrected bodies. It plays out spiritually and it plays out physically. Verse 7, the Lord is good. After all of this destruction here again, back to the Lord is good. So this is just. Uh, he is just, but he is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. So there we have it again, the idea of peace among, among adversity. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. These are days of trouble for these prophets. There are massive swings that are happening right now in, in uh, uh, world forces here in the Middle East. And there are major problems in, in Judah, in the, in the kingdom of Judah here, during Lehi's time. He also says, and he knoweth them that trust him. So trust in him would be faith in him. Do you have faith even though there are, you're living in a day of trouble? That's what you would have to have living in Lehi's time in Jerusalem or in, 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 uh, in Judah. Now, down in 14 and 15, uh, this, of course, is something I like because it brings us right back to Isaiah 52, 7. Look at what 14 says. And the Lord giveth a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods, this is Nineveh, will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. So we're talking about idol worship here. Okay, there's a lot of idol, idolatry going on in, in Assyria. Now, well, I'll get to this in a minute. Then 15, behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. That's Isaiah 52, 7, which is anchored, I believe, in the Israelite temple drama. It's what we get right before we go into Isaiah 53 with a suffering servant. Now, who is, the person, who is the one with the feet upon the mountain? Well, primarily, as we learn from Abinadi, there's three different groups or representations of this. Number one is Jesus Christ. It's Jehovah. So we're talking about the idolatry here in verse 14 of all these different gods. Well, you're, you're following these idols. Let me go into telling you about Jehovah is what Nahum is saying. 15, behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and publisheth peace. This is Jehovah. This is Jesus Christ. Of course, Abinadi tells us the second group would be the prophets more than likely. And the third group is probably those that follow the prophets and maybe those that even go through and have uh, uh, the ordinances of the temple with them. And uh, have the, the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood pronounced upon them. So 
anchored here in Isaiah 52, 7, part of the Israel, ancient Israelite uh, coronation ceremony as part of the temple imagery and drama that we talk about. Now, just a quick note here on this. Why does that matter? Why would he be telling this to these idol worshipers in, in Nineveh and Assyria? We, we need to understand that anciently the, the kingdoms in the Middle East are, there's a lot of syncretism. What is syncretism? Syncretism is saying, okay, um, I know what your gods are. I'm going to kind of move them over into my culture and into my way of thinking and maybe even into my gods. And I might create a new god based on your god. So when I say syncretism, what I'm talking about is the, the, uh, um, the spreading of religions amongst each of these kingdoms. They... They know who Jehovah is. It's not like they don't know who Jehovah is. This is where Jonah preached many, many years before. They, they know who Jehovah is. They know he is the, the God of the, of the Israelites. And so Nahum can be talking about this and professing about this, even if it is to the Assyrians. They would understand this. They know who Jehovah is. The Egyptians know who Jehovah is. The Babylonians know who Jehovah is. Yeah, just like we get the gods listed in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of these other kingdoms. They know who these gods are. And many times, the other kingdom, or the, the Israelites, the Judahites, worship those other foreign gods. Well, in those other kingdoms, many of them, would not many, but a number of them would have worshipped Jehovah. Just like with uh, uh, Elisha, who, who uh, boy, I always forget his name. Is it, it's almost like Nahum, right? It's uh, the general who is going to be bathed seven times in the River Jordan to be cleansed of, of leprosy. Um, how does that happen? It's because his maidservant in a war was taken as a slave from from uh, in, into Syria and she is a believer right she has the religion of Jehovah and and there she is and she's still worshiping about it she tells the general about this and about Elisha the prophet and this is how you can be cleansed it, this is it's a smaller world than we might imagine back then in chapter 2 he is going to talk of the destruction of Nineveh uh, a few things here I want to mention. We're going to get a couple mentions of this here. But in verse 6 of chapter 2, the gates of the rivers shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. So this is how it happens. This is how Nineveh falls to the Babylonians. Uh, they have, uh, aside from a front major gate, they have rivers that are coming into the city. And these rivers are are, there's a wall over the top of them, but above them there are gates, perhaps for boats that would come through. And and so, um, what do the Babylonians do? They they divert the waters from these rivers, and you know who knows how deep they are, but they they divert the waters from the rivers, and therefore underneath these gates, under the walls. They can, they can go ahead and get right into the city. So that's how that happens. The gates of the river shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. That's exactly what happens. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold. This is a very much a pronouncement about the wealth and the materialism and the allure of Nineveh that it has been as a ruling kingdom in the Middle East. Look at verse 10 here. She is empty and void. This is Nineveh and waste and the heart melteth. And the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins. And the faces of them all gather blackness. This is, again, and I talk about this with the Book of Mormon, we need to be careful the way we think about how curses happen and how skin color happens. This is a metaphor, obviously, here. Where else do we get this as a metaphor? Throughout the scriptures. We should probably think about that even in terms of the curses that are listed in the Book of Mormon. All the faces of them all gather blackness, 
right? What does that mean? It's countenance. It's talking about their countenance, okay? Verse 11, where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? So this is, you have Assyria, the, the, the symbol of Assyria is this ferocious lion. Well, where, where is this ferocious lion? Even the old lion walked in the lion's whelp and none made them afraid. Right? Where, where, where are these lions that are in Assyria that are about to fall to the Babylonians? Well, we're going to learn about that here. And it's important. I, I believe it's a very important message for us today in what's happening in the West, especially in the United States. We go to chapter 3 here. Woe to the bloody city. This is Nineveh. It is all full of lies and robbery. Think about lies and robbery. There, there's no, the truth is being lost and, and of course, trust, right? Trust. So the, the Nineveh has become extremely decadent in every possible way. And you can't survive. No civilization can survive that way because our societies are built off of eventually eternal principles, now, you can, you can make it last for a while. You can use tyranny. You can use conquering. Uh, you can use a number of these things. But eventually, those, the rot within society is going to create weakness with, the, with that country. And they're full of lies and robbery. The horsemen of the Chaldeans or the, or the Babylonians lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Right again, this is a vision that Nahum is having. And then in verse 4, again, as we've talked about the weakness that is happening here, because of the, it says, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot. Okay, the well-favored harlot is, is Nineveh. Right? The well-favored harlot is Nineveh. And, you know, again, cities are personified as women because they're like vessels of, of all the citizens. And, and so you have, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, you would look at witchcrafts here as, um, think of it in terms of a false priesthood. Right, the, the policies and procedures and priesthoods and rites of a religion that would be anti-doctrine of Christ. That's how I would look at that. Uh, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. So when you see the term whoredoms in the Old Testament in, in the King James Version, usually what you're talking about here are religious rites. So they're worshiping gods or goddesses, and this has become a major part of their culture. And their weakness, right, is, is the breaking down of the law of chastity. That is what is happening in our society. And when that happens, when you break apart the order, what does that law of chastity really do? It supports families, traditional families. And when you break down the law of chastity, you're going to break down order. And, and that's what's happening here. And, of course, you get the same mention of families here with witchcraft. Now, those families might be, maybe they're sp specific families. They're ruling families. It doesn't matter. It's, it's going to, the, it, it's Nineveh and her whoredoms. The breaking down of, of, of the law of chastity is going to sell uh, the, it sells to other nations these things, and, and, and it takes families uh, by her witchcrafts. It's the same idea. And then down here, the same thing that's happening today. Verse 13, another condition that he's seeing here in this vision. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. <laughs> the gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. This is, again, what happens. And the fire shall devour thy bars. Okay. What are we saying here? Behold, thy, the, the people in the midst of thee are women. They're talking about the men. They're talking about the men and how they are acting, how they would perceive this, very in, politically incorrect today, but they're acting like women in the sense that, okay, they are going to be conquered by the Babylonians and there is no male masculine might 
to defend their families and their citizens and their, their country and their city. And you see this today with the breakdown of masculinity, the absolute attack on masculinity and femininity. And, and you know, I've got something coming out on the androgynous Jesus here in a couple of days, but it's uh, that, that's being pushed in our own circles, unfortunately. But it's a, you know, it, it's this, this is basically saying, look, you have taken masculinity and the men have lost all of their masculinity and their might and their strength and they've become like women. And so you can see, again, this breakdown of this order through through the whoredoms, through the breakdown of the law of chastity, it destroys the order of God. That's what's happening here. Okay, so we go from Nahum over to Habakkuk. And Habakkuk also is a contemporary here with Lehi. And he's going to focus on the rise of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians over the Assyrians. This is very important to them, right? This is, this is, a, this is going to change everything for Judah for the, the, the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. It is why Lehi is going to leave. It is, it is that the whole city and, and, and country is going to be destroyed by these Chaldeans. Again, verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk, the doom, right, the imminent doom, which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. Okay, now is he seeing these things personally himself, or is he, all, he also seeing this in a vision, Right? Something that, that is he's seeing is, is, is going to be happening. Is this given to him as a vision? Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Well, remember, the Lord is, as we heard from Nahum, he is slow to, to throw judgment out there on, on, on people. He's going to let this play out. He's going to let this play out in our lives in, in these last days as well. How long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? This sounds a lot like Joseph Smith in, in Liberty Jail in section 122 and 120, 121 and 122. Therefore, the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth. Why is this? Let me back up here. Let's go back to verse, verse 3. Why dost thou shew me iniquity, show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? Why do I have to deal with all of this? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are there there are that raise up strife and contention. This is this is the world of Lehi. Uh, therefore, the law is slacked, right? And judgment doth never go forth. Why? When he means judgment, he means justice. Real justice doesn't go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Remember, this is during the time of the Josiah reforms that's going on here in, 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 in Jerusalem and Judah. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. So the majority of the people are wicked. That's the problem. And the Lord says, I raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. And and this is something that that Habakkuk has a real problem with. He doesn't quite understand this. Right? He says in verse 12, "Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God?" In other words, are are you not the eternal God? O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. You're ordaining the Babylonians for judgment. The wicked people are going to be ordained for judgment from the Lord? Yeah. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Well, look at the Book of Mormon, right? With the Book of Mormon, you have the Nephites, and the Lamanites are placed there always as a check against the Nephites. The Lord sanctions that. The Lord sanctions the adversity. The Lord sanctions the adversity in all of our lives. it's, It's the only way to move forward. All right, back to Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. The tower, by the way, is oftentimes used as a word for the Holy of Holies in the temple. Verse 2, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Okay, it's a vision. Or at least the second one is, but the first one probably was too. I think there's five visions with Habakkuk in his book here. 
write the vision and make it plain upon tables or tablets that he may run that readeth. In other words, he, when, he see, when, when one sees what is going to happen here and they read this, they can be prepared and run. Well, of course they don't. Very few do. Lehi does with his family. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. Okay, so it's set for a certain time when these things are going to happen. Okay, now we're going to bounce all the way to Zephaniah. We're going to skip chapter 3 in, in Habakkuk. So we've seen here from Nahum to begin with that the Assyrians are going to fall. That's what's being prophesied. Uh, Habakkuk is talking about the rise of the Babylonians. Well, the Babylonians are the ones that are going to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, so the destruction of Judah here with Zephaniah. And in verse 1, the word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, or Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, King Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Again, this is all happening during the Lehi's life. Uh, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea. This is interesting because... In verse 3 here, what we get is the exact opposite of the creation sequence in Genesis, where you'd have the fishes of the sea, then the fowls of the air, and then the beasts, and then man. Right here, it's the men, and then the man, and then the beast, and then the fowls, and then the fishes. So it's, it's an opposite process. It's, a, it's not a process of creation here in that sense. It's a process of destruction that is coming. And he's saying that everything's going to be lost. Verse 13, therefore their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards but not drink the wine thereof. So the process is all going to be, they're not going to get the fruits of their labor, so to speak, right? They're, they're, going, to, they're, they're going to think that they are, they are building their, their agriculture and their homes and their pricey mansions and, and yet, they're not going to be inhabit them. And then finally here in chapter 3, Zephaniah, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyeth not the voice. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous. Let's see what they've got here for light. Wanton. Yeah, they're wanton and treacherous persons. <laughs> Again, her prophets. All right, so you have, you have Nahum here preaching here. You've got Habakkuk. You've got Zephaniah. You've got Jeremiah. You've got Lehi. You've got Uriah. You've got all these prophets here, but there are many other prophets, whatever they mean by that, that are, that are prophesying the wrong things. They're the ones that are corrupting the temple. They're the ones that are uh, corrupting the ordinances. They're the ones that are saying, no, you need to side with Egypt and not Babylon. While Jeremiah and those with him are saying, no, we need to side with Babylon. And of course, that's not what happens. Further in verse 4 here, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. They're destroying everything. It's just like Abinadi talking to, to the King Noah and, and the priests. They're not really following the Ten Commandments. They're not really following the law. They are, they are destroying the ordinances of the temple. That's the world of Lehi. That's where they're at. And then he says, giving the metaphor here for the last days, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now, you can take that literally or not here. With what's happening there, we talk about the end of the world uh, uh, as we know it, right? We have uh, the idea of the flood being the baptism and uh, of, of water and the uh, end of the earth being the, 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 the flood of fire, so to speak, being baptized by fire. Um, I, I take it literally or not, I don't know. But that's he's talking about the last days here. He says, for then I will turn to the people a pure language. See, language is really interesting, isn't it? Because 
language can mean everything. It is about our communication. It is about the ideas that we have. It's, it's articulation of our thoughts. It is communication and persuasion to others that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent, maybe one mind and one heart. I like that phrase, right? I will turn to the people a pure language. In that day, he says in verse 11, shalt thou shall not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. And thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. This is, this is the temple this is the corruption of the temple, right? That's the center of everything. When you corrupt the temple, you corrupt the ordinances, you corrupt the entire language and the society that, that looks to the temple at its core, at the center. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. That is who will be a remnant, right? There's always a remnant that is left. Well, usually a remnant that is left. So the, the decadence of Assyria is going to bring them down and is going to weaken them. The, the weakening of the family, the weakening of the men uh, who are going to lose their masculinity and their strength, so to speak, and become like women. The weakening uh, through de- the decadence of, of, uh, of breaking the law of chastity, right, and becoming a, an idolatrous and a... Um, a, a fornicating, a, a highly fornicating civilization. You can't, you can't withstand the problems from that. There are natural laws to the family. And, and when you break that down, you're going to have natural consequences. That's what's going to happen. And the consequence is that the Babylonians are going to come in. They are going to conquer the Assyrians. They go down. They conquer Egypt also, who the false prophets wanted uh, the Judah, Jerusalem to to side with, and uh, and then of course they're going to conquer Jerusalem and, and Judah, and they're going to destroy the temple and and destroy much of Jerusalem, and take a large percentage of people uh, of the of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin to Babylon, uh, and uh, and things change forever from that point, and this of course is the environment that Lehi and his family are living in, the, this this tumultuous period of, of change of, of, of power structures with, uh, with the nation states around them. And then the Babylonians who are going to be coming in to destroy uh, Jerusalem is part of why Lehi needs to leave, right? It's not the only reason. He's got to leave because they're going to kill him because he's preaching about Jesus Christ. I'll talk to you soon.